Good afternoon. So quiz number three is up. There's still some people who haven't taken one or two. Take it. It's for your own good. And those listening, take it, please. I know probably you all here have completed it, but the people not. Quizzes. Um, second thing, Wednesday, Dr. Silverstein will be lecturing. I will not be here. He's not the greatest with the equipment. It has happened that recordings have not been made, although this time I am sure it will work. Right? You wouldn't lay bet on it? Okay, just a warning, you might want to come to Wednesdays. Uh, he will also be lecturing a week from Wednesday. I will be back by then and make sure it works. So you will miss one at, at the most, right? <clears throat> but I'm going to teach him how to do it today. And well, Last year he missed one, so just a warning. Okay? Anything else? Okay. Lights. We got lights. I want to go over some slides from last time, which I didn't get a chance to get to. Uh, take the lights down for this. Now, you remember I told you the movie of flu uh, exploding wasn't right. I just want to show you a still from the movie to show you why. Okay, these are two captures. Here's one. All right, so start on the bottom. They have this image with an envelope around a capsid. Is that right for influenza virus? No. What is, is she shaking her head no? <laughs> no, it's not right. The influenza RNA is wrapped up in a helical nucleocapsid, not a capsid like this. So this is wrong. And then when it comes apart, you see there are triangles here. If you see a triangle, what do you think of? A icosahedron, right. This is not an icosahedron. So this is wrong. Uh, the artist's rendition is incorrect. Okay, so that's that. Remember, flu is an envelope virus with a nucleocapsid helically arranged, and it does have a protein around it that forms a shell, but it's not called a capsid. That's just the M protein, which has a variety of other functions. Okay, so that's what's wrong with the movie. Uh, then we didn't finish at the end of last time. I just want to quickly go through a few slides. One was to show you an example of uh, a virus that uses two, two receptors to attach to cells. And I wanted to go through this because maybe you're thinking, why would a virus need two receptors? Shouldn't one be enough? And in theory, yes, because a lot of viruses, in fact, use just one receptor. But Coxsackie group B viruses need two. One is called DAF, and the other is called CAR. These viruses initiate infection at the epithelial surface like this. But the problem here is that CAR, one of the two receptors, is a component of tight junctions, which are right here next to cells, not at the top. So these receptors are not on the top of the cell. So how does the virus infect? Um, the, the mechanism is very interesting, and it's elucidated by this experiment. I just want to show you this because it's very neat. So these are cells, um, polarized cells, which means they have a top and a bottom growing in a plastic dish, and they've infected them with Coxsackie virus, and then they're using antibodies to look at where the virus is and where CAR is and where DAF is, so the virus and the two receptors. So here on the left is, is the virus, so they bind the virus at low temperature so it stays on the surface of the cell, and if you stain for the virus, you see there's green all over the top of the cell. So all the virus particles are bound all over uh, the top of the cell. Now, what is it binding to? It's binding to DAF. So here on the right is a staining for DAF, which is one of the two receptors for Coxsackie virus. So Coxsackie is binding to the surface, and it is binding to DAF. Now, when you raise the temperature, remember at 4 degrees, viruses remain bound to the surface. When you raise the temperature, you start the infection. The viruses start to move into the cell. And so what you see right away, within 30 minutes, the virus green here, has all moved to the junctions between cells. So these are individual cells. And that's where DAF is, is as well. Is, I'm sorry. And, and DAF has also relocalized in these images as well. So remember, it was originally spread out over the top. Now it's relocalizing to the junctions. Now, if you keep going in the infection, the virus moves into the cell. Now it's around the nucleus. Here are the nuclei here. And it's beginning to replicate. And that's as far as we need to take it there. Now, if you look at CAR, to start with, CAR is in red. 
car is always at the junctions. Remember, this is a protein stuck in the junctions between cells. It's not on the apical surface. And it stays there throughout infection. And you can see here, we're staining just for car. And the cool thing here is that eventually DAF relocalizes to be where car is. And in this third uh, column here is the merge of the green and the red colors. You see it's yellow. And that just tells you that DAF and car are now in the same place on the cell. So what seems to be happening here is the virus binds to DAF. DAF relocalizes to where car is. And then the virus can bind also car to get into cells. So that's in the, for this virus, that's why it needs two receptors. So let's show that in a schematic. So Coxsackie is binding uh, DAF, which is on the apical surface of the cell. So this is an accessible receptor. But apparently, it's not enough to get the virus into cells. Otherwise, the virus would enter at the top. This virus requires CAR, which is stuck in here in the tight junctions between cells. So the virus binds DAF, and it moves to the junction, and then eventually CAR. Now, the neat thing, in addition, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it going inside the cell or staying along the surface? It, it seems to be staying on the surface, but that movement requires some rearrangement of the actin microfilaments beneath the surface. And so what happens here, the binding of the virus to DAF actually triggers a signal transduction network, and that loosens up the microfilaments so that the receptor can move along to the tight junctions. So the binding to DAF not only allows it to move, but it, it loosens up the cell surface so it can move. Okay, so that's just an example of why a virus would need two receptors, because the entry receptor, which is this one, CAR, that's the one that endocytes with the virus, that's in the tight junction. So the virus binds to a different receptor on the surface, moves to the CAR receptor, and then gets in. Okay? All right. Uh, there is also um, another example of entry that I wanted to tell you about, and this is for real viruses. These are these RNA viruses that have uh, two concentric icosahedral shells that make up the capsid. So just think of an icosahedral shell, there are two of them, an outer one and an inner one. And this is actually a virus we'll talk about today with respect to RNA synthesis. This virus is taken up uh, by endocytosis standard procedure we've talked about. Uh, and this, uh, the, the endosomes eventually fuse with lysosomes. And you know, lysosomes are full of proteases. These proteases in the lysosome take off the outer capsid, the outer icosahedral shell. And then that product is called ISVP, uh, infectious subviral particle, that then gets out of the lysosome slash endosome and then ends up in the cytoplasm as what's known as a core. So the core is simply the inner icosahedral shell. The outer one is stripped off in the endosome, and you'll see later on today that this is what then starts to produce viral RNA. So this is why we have two shells on these viruses. The first one protects the virus as it moves around outside of cells. It's stripped off during endocytosis, so the virus has evolved to take advantage of endocytosis, all well, those enzymes in the lysosomes come in and take off the capsid. And then that produces a particle that can push its way out of the endosome because it's very hydrophobic. <clears throat> uh, so we've talked about last time many different ways that a virus can get from the cell surface along microtubules uh, to near the nucleus if it needs be. Now let's talk about that final step. Many viruses have to get their genetic material into the nucleus. In particular, most DNA viruses have to get their genomes in the nucleus because they're using the enzymes of the host cell, and those are in the nucleus. Um, so a few RNA viruses also have to get there as well. So let's see how that happens. <clears throat> there are four different mechanisms shown here for how you can get viral nucleic acids into the nucleus. The first one we've seen already is influenza virus. This is one of the few RNA viruses that has to get its nucleic acid uh, in the nucleus. It doesn't use any enzymes there from the cell, but it uses other precursors that we'll talk about. When the virus is uncoded from the endosome, all the ribonucleic acids bound to proteins are released. And those are quite small. Uh, those are these chain-like 
molecules here. These are basically helical structures, RNA plus protein. Just think of those magnetic beads that we wrapped around into a helix. That's what those are. And those just can pop through the nuclear pore. You know, the nucleus has these big pore structures in them that actively transport material into the nucleus. And you, proteins in, in general need to have specific signals for that. And in fact, the influenza RNPs, ribonucleoproteins we call them, can do that. So that's one mechanism. You're small enough to fit through. Uh, the, some of the larger DNA viruses can't get through these nuclear pores. They're physically too big. So there are two strategies here for getting nucleic acids in. Herpes viruses dock onto the pore. The intact viri on the capsid docks on the pore, and the nucleic acid, which is a double-stranded DNA, goes through that portal. Remember, the portal on the capsid, which we looked at uh, a few lectures ago, allows the DNA to get out into the nucleus. Other viruses, like adenoviruses, still too big to get into the pore. They, they start to disassemble in the endosome, and by the time they reach the nuclear pore, they dock onto it. They're in a largely disassembled state. And we'll see in a moment that disassembly goes on a bit further at the nuclear pore, and then the nucleic acid can go in. And then there's some very small viruses like the parvoviruses uh, that are single-stranded DNA-containing viruses. These are actually small enough to fit uh, through the nuclear pore. So they move through and get rid of the nucleic acid there. All right, so four general strategies for how you can cross the nuclear membrane. And the last example is adenovirus, which I told you docks in a partially disassembled form onto the nuclear pore. So here is the nucleus here. The cytoplasm would be up here. And there is a nuclear pore. Adenovirus is partially disassembled. It's come out of the endosome. It's moved to a nuclear pore. And now it's sitting on the nuclear pore. And in the nucleus, as you know, um, there are histones. These are these uh, oval-shaped proteins here. And these actually go through the pore, out of the pore, and contact the capsid. And they bind to the hexon protein, which is one of the capsid proteins. And they start to disassemble it. And then they're imported back into the nucleus, the histones, bound to these capsid proteins. And that further disassembles the capsid. So an essential nuclear component of histone actually participates in the disassembly. So here we show capsid disassembly mediated by uh, the histone moving back in. And then finally, the DNA is in the capsid. What's left of the capsid, it's a, this, the blue molecule with the orange dots. The orange dots uh, is a, uh, a viral protein called protein 7. And that protein has a nuclear localization signal on it. And that's what you need to get into the nucleus using the import machinery. So that's how the DNA gets in. Uh, the import machinery binds these proteins, which are bound to DNA, and pulls the genome into the nucleus. OK, so that's one detailed example of how uh, a virus moves its nucleic acid uh, into the nucleus. Now, for the next two lectures, we're going to talk about the nucleic acid <coughs> synthesis that happens when these viruses uncoat. So we've talked about how both DNA and RNA viruses put their nucleic acid genomes in different parts of the cell. Today, we're going to focus on RNA synthesis. And uh, just a little bit of history so you know when, when things happened. Um, <clears throat> you, I think we mentioned already in 1935, tobacco mosaic virus was crystallized, the first crystals of a virus to be made. A year later, he showed that uh, those crystals have about 5% RNA in them. The rest was protein. He actually thought the protein was more important. He was wrong. But he did show that there was RNA in these viruses. In 1944, you remember, the, the um, Avery et al. experiment showing that DNA is genetic material of bacteria. The Hershey Chase experiment doing the same thing in 52 for bacteriophages. Watson and Crick's structure of DNA uh, solved in 1953. Terrific year, by the way. Um, 1956, it was shown that tobacco mosaic virus nucleic acid is infectious. And that was the first time it was shown that RNA could be genetic material. Remember, these experiments in 44 and 52 were done with DNA. So no one thought that RNA could be genetic material. By 1959, RNA was found in many animal viruses. And then in the 1960s, people started saying, how does this RNA get duplicated? Because as far as we know, cells cannot duplicate RNA. So that's where we start today. So here is a molecule of RNA. And it's used to illustrate 
a, a couple of important principles that we need to remember. First, the genome has to be copied end to end without any loss. You can't lose sequences at the end, otherwise eventually you have nothing left, right? That sounds trivial, but it's not easy to accomplish, and it, we have to keep it in mind. Furthermore, we have to make viral mRNAs that can be translated uh, by the cell. Always remember that no matter what the virus that we're talking about, you have to be able to make mRNA. So we have to do two things with these RNA genomes. We have to replicate them completely and make mRNA from them. So here, is, so here are the genomes we're going to talk about today, the RNA genomes. We will talk about viruses with double-stranded RNA, uh, viruses with negative-stranded, single-stranded RNA, and we will talk about viruses with positive-strand genomes, how they replicate and how they make messenger RNA, sometimes two distinct processes. There's another group of viruses here with a plus-strand RNA genome, the retroviruses, but they are so special that they get a lecture all to themselves. So we're not going to talk about those today, although we'll mention them briefly. So here is a, a seminal experiment done in, I don't know, the early 60s, uh, which is using technology that isn't really used anymore, but what was done here, this was the first identification of an RNA polymerase, an enzyme that can copy a big viral RNA. And this happens to be done with poliovirus. And what was done was to infect cells with the virus. And then at different times after infection, you can see hours here. Only six hours is pretty quick. Uh, we're looking at virus production here on the right, plaque forming units per mil. And that's the dotted line. See, this is a wonderful one step growth curve. You can see a little uh, eclipse period and then production of virus, eventually plateauing. And then on the left, they're measuring RNA polymerase activity. And what they did in this experiment, they would at each time after infection take the cells and crack them open with a detergent and then add a, a nucleoside triphosphate, which had a label probably, um, uh, I would guess 1960s, it was probably tritium or C14, doesn't really matter. But it was a radioactive <laughs> isotope and then they would ask, is there any of that isotope incorporated into big RNA molecules? And you can see that, in fact, starting at about two hours after infection, you do see big RNAs made in the cell. So this is the first example of RNA polymerase activity in cells. So that's an experiment where you take a cell extract and you incubate it with a labeled precursor, an NTP, ATP, UTP, CTP, or GTP doesn't really matter, and you measure the incorporation into nucleic acid. What was also found very early on was that this synthesis that we've just measured with radioactivity is resistant to actinomycin D. It's a, a compound extracted from fungi. Does anyone know what actinomycin D does? It inhibits DNA-dependent RNA synthesis. So in fact, if uh, some of the early ideas were that these viruses copied their RNA into DNA, and that was copied then from DNA back to RNA, because no one could understand how RNA could be copied to RNA. So they found that this was, in fact, resistant to that drug, showing that it's not a DNA-RNA step involved in the synthesis. So these experiments were done with poliovirus and related viruses. There are plus-strand RNA viruses. It was then the same experiments were done with minus-strand viruses. The difference here, which is really important, is that for poliovirus, the polymerase is found only in infected cells. It's not in the virus particle itself. It's not in the virion. For negative strand viruses, which were then studied in the same way, they could find the polymerase in infected cells, but they could also find it in the virion. And that's, of course, because the negative strand viruses, when that RNA gets into the cell, this, nothing can be done with it. The cell can't translate it because it's a negative strand. So those viruses have to bring in an enzyme into the cell. Okay? That's a really important concept. So you have to remember that fundamental difference between plus and minus strand viruses. Uh, eventually, over the years, it got to be that as new viruses were discovered, you could just look at the sequence of what you thought might be a polymerase, and you could identify it by sequence signature. So there is one trio of amino acids, uh, glycine asp-asp, 
which is a signature for certain kinds of RNA polymerases. And then you could say, aha, this is the RNA polymerase, and then express it and show that it has the right activity. And now we have crystal structures of many RNA polymerases, which show how they work. So some terminology. Replicase is the enzyme that copies RNA to produce genomes. The transcriptase is the enzyme that produces mRNA. And typically, we say transcription uh, is copying DNA into RNA. So this, these two are a little confusing because for RNA viruses that make mRNA from RNA templates, it's not really a transcriptase, but it's called that anyway. A promoter is a sequence that controls uh, the transcription of DNA templates. That is the making of RNA from DNA, and you'll hear more about that uh, next Wednesday. And the nature of the RNA template. Remember, RNA genomes, uh, minus strand RNA genomes, are in the virion coated with protein. Remember, they're wrapped up in those helical structures. And they're ready to begin RNA synthesis as soon as they get in the cell. Again, negative strand genomes have to come into a cell with an enzyme ready to copy them in some way. Otherwise, the infection won't work. Plus strand genomes are ready to go. They're typically naked in the virion. They don't have any proteins attached to them. And they can be translated upon entry. There's one exception, and that's that unusual family, the retroviruses that we'll talk about separately. They have plus stranded RNA in their <laughs> genomes and their particles, but they are not translated upon entry into the cell. So unfortunately, that's a one exception you're going to have to remember. We'll see what happens to them later. <clears throat> Double-stranded RNA genomes, remember, you can't translate them. The mRNA can't be accessed by the ribosomes. So they have to be copied into mRNA. And that is done by the virus polymerase. Because again, the, the cell cannot copy uh, these viral RNAs. So with the exception of retroviruses, you can almost predict all these steps that have to happen upon infection. Now, the negative strand uh, genomes that are bound to proteins, we have talked about before in terms of helical structures. But just to reiterate that, here's vesicular stomatitis virus. This is the nucleocapsid, which is simply the RNA wrapped up in that one protein, the N protein, nucleocapsid protein, repeated many times. And that's the magnet thing I showed you the other day. So the RNA is in here in green, and these are the proteins. This virus happens to be also wrapped in an envelope. So all the animal viruses that have helical symmetry in their genomes are also wrapped in membranes. The plant viruses are not always. Remember, tobacco mosaic virus is just a naked uh, helical nucleocapsid. And this is just a molecular view of this interaction. Here's a short piece of VSV RNA. And it's bound to the nucleocapsid protein. Here's a monomer. And you can see how multiples interact both with each other and with the viral RNA. So for the negative strand viruses, again, the RNA comes encoded with these proteins and also with other proteins that are enzymes to copy those genomes. Now, RNA can have a lot of secondary and tertiary structures. And here's an illustration of some of them. You can have stems and stem loops formed by base pairing among complementary regions. And they can be very simple, like this one, or they can, have, they can be complex with multi-branched loops, interior loops, uh, bulges, and hairpin loops, and so forth. There's also a structure called a pseudo-knot, because it looks like a knot, as you would tie in a string, but it isn't. And that is happening when you have a stem loop where the loop bases base pair with bases downstream of the stem loop. So what happens is these can base pair. They form something like this which in reality actually twists. And if you look at the structure, uh, the three-dimensional structures of these which have been solved, they, they look exactly like knots. We're going to encounter these in some uh, viral genomes, and that's why I'm telling you about them now. In principle, viral RNAs can look very complicated with lots of secondary structures. Remember, they're not just lines on the page. We draw them that way for simplicity so we can explain things. But they probably look like this. This RNA, which is a coronavirus RNA is probably almost all secondary structure, that is, base paired regions with large loops. And there's probably very little single stranded structure present. OK, the rules for RNA synthesis. First of all, it, it initiates and terminates at very specific sites on the template. Sometimes the RNA polymerase, which we call RNA P, 
may initiate synthesis de novo. That means without a primer. De novo simply means without a primer. And cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerases work that way. Those are the enzymes that make mRNA from DNA. They don't need a primer. Some RNA polymerases of viruses don't, and some do. There's no way to really make any rules for that. It just can vary depending on the virus. Sometimes we need other viral and cell proteins to make mRNA, so the polymerase itself isn't needed, isn't the only thing necessary. And finally, RNA is synthesized on a template, of course. You copy a template by stepwise incorporation of NTPs, and we always elongate in a five to three prime direction, very similar to the rules for, for making DNA. So that's templated synthesis. There are also some examples where RNA is made without a template, but for only very short regions, and we'll talk about those. So here are some examples of initiation. Here's de novo initiation. You have a three prime end of an RNA. Remember, the RNAs are always some kind of green color. And here's an example of how you put the first complementary base down at the three prime end, the polymerase does this. Doesn't need a primer, it's just sitting down in the template and putting a base there. And sometimes those are just single bases that are added, sometimes they're capped here. Uh, it doesn't really matter. And here are two examples of primer dependent initiation. Remember we said some of the polymerases need a primer, some of them don't. Here are two examples of priming. Here the protein, the primer is a short piece of nucleic acid actually linked to a protein. This is called protein-linked priming, and we'll see an example of that for polio. Sometimes the, pro the primers are capped. The caps, of course, are structures on the five prime ends of cellular messenger RNAs. Uh, these are important for translation, but sometimes they are used for priming viral RNA polymerases. Uh, this, all of you should know, having taken some kind of biology or biochemistry class, it's the way that nucleic acids are synthesized. Again, there's a template. For the most part, we're going to talk about using a template here. A primer hybridizes to the template, and then new bases are added by the polymerase to the three prime end. So the, the template is read in a three to five prime direction, but the product is synthesized in a five to three prime direction. So those are universal rules for nucleic acid synthesis. And this just shows you a typical uh, template primer arrangement. Uh, this happens to be DNA. You can tell because there's a T uh, instead of a U here. And we have uh, two, three uh, bases paired here. And you can see that the addition of a new uh, triphosphate or an NTP to the growing chain uh, comes about by a series of essentially nucleophilic attacks uh, on the phosphates and oxygens uh, that constitute this. Uh, we don't need to know this for this course. This is something you, you, you should know already. But it happens exactly the same way for viruses as it does for cellular enzymes. Now, all of the representatives of the different kinds of, of nucleic acid polymerases have been studied a lot. We have RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. We have RNA-dependent DNA polymerases. We have DNA-DNA. And then we have DNA polymerases that make mRNA. So there are four classes that we know about. We've got sequences of all these. We have crystal structures of all of them. And this is the way the sequences of these polymerases line up. You can see they have a lot of conserved regions. Those are the green parts here. Uh, and there are also unique portions to each polymerase as well. And a couple of points I want to make out. All the polymerases of plus-strand RNA viruses, they have a Gly-ASP-ASP. -ASP. That's that GDD sequence I talked about earlier which is present here in this part of the polymerase. So that's right there. Uh, the segmented minus strand enzymes have an ASP-ASP there as well. And in non-segmented minus strand polymerases, there's a, a gly asp these are not These are not things I would ask you to recall, but I, I just want to tell you this because it's a way of identifying particular polymerases. So there are some conserved regions, but there are also lots of unique regions. They probably all evolve from a common precursor, and then evolved to two different kinds of polymerization. So here is the structure of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of polioviruses. Uh, these all re resemble a hand uh, with a thumb domain, a fingers domain, and a palm. And the palm is typically the active site of the enzyme. Um, and here in the middle, 
of this is the active site. And in fact, there, these are two very important side chains here that were involved in polymerization of nucleic acid. So we're, we're not quite sure how the nucleic acid moves in these, but one model is that the template moves uh, through the bottom here, passes the active site where then the synthesis is done, and then the product moves out of the top of the enzyme. So the active site is here, then everything else is involved in template discrimination and adding specific kinds of triphosphates. This is an interesting part of the enzyme. Uh, this is the polio RNA polymerase, and we're looking very close in at the active site. And this is probably the interaction. Here's the uh, active site of the enzyme in red, and there are a variety of side chains shown here. And this is a triphosphate. You can see the three phosphates here that's coming into the active site. It's about to be added to the next, to the next base in the growing chain. And this base uh, this is an ASP at 238. You can see it's hydrogen bonding here. Uh, that is probably how these enzymes discriminate DNA from RNA. So you, if this is an RNA polymerase, you're going to copy an RNA template. You only want to add uh, ribonucleoside triphosphates here. And of course, they have a hydroxyl group here in this position, and they will base pair, they will hydrogen bond with this ASP at 238. If a DNTP moved in here, it wouldn't form this base pair, and it would be rejected. So this is a very nice way how these enzymes can discriminate between DNTPs and NTPs, of course, which are all floating around in the cell uh, at the same time. And here's a model of how uh, the primer and template fit into uh, this active site. So here is one of these RNA polymerases. We've actually cut away the front. Uh, here's the active site up here, these red regions. And there's usually a metal, a, man a magnesium or a manganese that's absolutely required for catalysis. That's that little ball right there. Uh, the template is in yellow, and the primer is in green. And this is the next triphosphate about to be added to this chain sitting in the active site. So it gives you some idea of the architecture of this complex. So let's talk about some of the overall uh, processes for do two different kinds of viruses. These are both plus strand RNA viruses. And we'll start with the, with the Flavi and Picorna viruses on the left. These viruses have a plus strand uh, RNA genome. It's copied through a negative strand intermediate, which is then copied to form plus strands. It's a very simple arrangement. The minus strand has no function other to serve as a template. So it's not translated. It doesn't have anything else to do in the cell except be copied again to make plus strands. So the flavies have a cap at the 5' prime end of their genome. And this is basically an mRNA. So for these viruses, the mRNA and the genome are exactly the same thing. So when you make a genome, you're making mRNA. The picornas don't have a cap up here, as you will see. They have a little protein uh, linked to the 5' prime end. And as we'll see later, the alpha viruses, which are also plus strand viruses, have a very different strategy of gene expression. So the picornaviruses, viruses, again, which are exemplified by the scheme on the left of that previous slide, we've seen this before. They bind receptors on cells, and the RNA needs to get in the cytoplasm. That's as far as it has to go, because it's a plus strand RNA, and it can be translated directly. So as soon as this RNA is in the cytoplasm, ribosomes recognize it, and they begin making viral proteins. Um, this RNA comes in naked. Remember, it's a plus-strand RNA. And because it's plus-stranded, it can be immediately recognized. It is, as I said, it is duplicated uh, through a negative strand intermediate, and that's shown on the right. So here is the input RNA, the viral RNA in um, Kelly Green, I guess. And then it becomes olive green, which is the negative strand. And then it becomes Kelly again, all right? And so it goes plus, minus, and plus. Very simple strategy, again, carried out by the viral RNA polymerase. This happens on membrane vesicles in the cytoplasm. It turns out that all of the plus strand RNA viruses do their RNA synthesis on vesicles, not just floating around in the cell. Remember, the cell is a crowded place. And the likelihood that an RNA and a polymerase and triphosphates are all going to bump into each other is pretty low. So what these viruses do are assemble replication complexes on vesicles, as shown here. And that makes it more efficient. Yes? Isn't mRNA degraded uh, much faster than like, regular DNA or RNA? So does this cell distinguish between what they want to be used as mRNA and what they want to be used as their genome? 
so different mRNAs are decayed at different rates depending on sequences in them. It's a, it's a carefully controlled process. Um, these viral RNAs are particularly stable. They've evolved to be very stable, so they're not degraded in the cell. And in fact, there's so much of them made eventually that they overwhelm the cell. And uh, eventually the cell mRNAs are degraded because they're not made anymore. They have a certain half-life. The viruses shut off transcription, so there's no more competition for translation. Right. Yes? Why do we, so why we need to make a minus strand? So, so the, the way uh, nucleic acid replication works, as you know, the nucleic acids are a series of bases. And to re replicate it, we have to make a complementary strand. So wherever there's an A, you have to make a strand with a T, and then you make an A again. So there's no other way to, to duplicate that nucleic acid without an intermediate. So double-stranded DNA, you remember, each strand is copied uh, to make new strands, but here we only have one, so we have to copy it through an intermediate. And that's the only function for these negative strands, just to serve as templates. So then in the Good question. When it comes in the cell, this plus strand RNA, what is the first thing that happens? Does it get translated or do you make a negative strand? Do you know the answer? You can look at this, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, you could translate it. And why is that? Why does the plus strand have to be translated and not replicated? Do you know? Anybody? You need the RNA polymerase because there's no way this RNA can be copied by the cell. Really important concept. You put a plus strand viral RNA in the cell, can't be copied. So it has to be translated first. You can, so if you just know that um, cells can't copy our viral RNAs, you can figure out what happens when a plus or a minus strand RNA comes into a cell. As we'll see, with a negative strand RNA, it has to be copied first. Therefore, it has to bring in a polymerase with it. Okay. So here's the polio genome. It's a plus strand RNA. It comes in the cell. It is immediately translated, and you get a what is called a polyprotein. This is one way of making a lot of proteins from a single message. Now, in eukaryotic cells, one messenger RNA, one protein. So viruses have to get around that limitation. In bacteria, that's not the issue. You can make uh, one mRNA can make several proteins, but not in mammalian cells for the most part. So how does polio get around that? And the Picornas and the Flavies, they make a long protein, and it's chopped up by proteases that are embedded uh, in the sequence. So they can make 12 proteins from one and from one precursor and one mRNA, right? So the RNA polymerase that is copying these genomes is translated down here. It's called 3D Paul. okay? Now the RNA has sequences or structures in it that are signals for RNA replication. And here's the RNA genome presented in a slightly different way. We have at the five prime end a clover leaf we have in the middle a stem loop, and at the three prime end, a pseudonaut. And these are all important signals for RNA replication. Now think, um, when, when polio infects a cell, and the, the polymerase is made, and it replicates the genome, it only copies viral RNAs. It never copies cellular mRNAs, even though cellular RNAs look pretty much like this. They have their RNA, and they have a a poly A sequence at the three prime end. So why wouldn't they be copied by the viral polymerase? Well, in fact, it's because of these kinds of structures that say, copy only this RNA. And these aren't present in messenger RNA, so they don't get copied. I'm going to show you why these confer specificity right now. Now, at the five prime end of the viral RNA, uh, shown here, this little orange dot, it is a small protein called VPG virion protein genome linked. It's 22 amino acids long. Here it is again in this slide. And it is covalently linked to the first base of the genome of polio. So here is the first uh, nucleotides of polio RNA. They fold into a clover leaf. And the first base is a U. And that is linked via this phosphodiester bond to a tyrosine 
on VPG. So this is a covalent leakage, uh, linkage. And uh, this, is actually, this protein is actually removed at some part of the infectious cycle, which we don't have to worry about, and that's what that arrow means. This protein is actually the primer for RNA replication. So polio RNA polymerase is a primer-dependent enzyme. It can't initiate synthesis de novo. And the primer is actually this protein linked to two uh, nucleotides, or two bases, which we will see. So the primer is made, actually, before uh, RNA synthesis can begin. And the important signal in the genome is this stem loop called CRE, which I showed you on this previous slide. is in, in a, somewhere in the middle of the genome. It actually is in different places in different coronaviruses. That doesn't matter too much. The point is, this is where the primer is initially synthesized. So what happens is the RNA polymerase shown here uh, binds as a dimer to this CRE. Uh, VPG comes along. And then the RNA polymerase actually copies uh, two A residues, which are in the loop of this CRE sequence. And that allows it to put two U's onto this VPG. So this is basically how this primer is synthesized by the polymerase by taking VPG, which has already been made so far in viral infection, and then linking two U's onto it. And the, the U's are templated by this CRE loop at the top here. Very interesting use of a stem loop. Now somehow this primer has to get to the three prime end of the mRNA, of the genome. Remember, initiation goes from the three prime end and synthesis in a five to three prime direction. So this primer has to get to the three prime end, yet the Cre sequences are in the middle of the genome. So this is the conundrum that has to be solved. And we think it's solved by circularizing the RNA. This is a hypothetical model for RNA replication, which has some very interesting elements. And the idea is that the RNA replication complex, which is shown at the top, is membrane bound. Remember, it occurs on the surface of those vesicles. It's held in place uh, to the membrane by a membrane protein, the viral protein called 3AB, which interacts with a cellular protein that in turn is binding this clover leaf. And that is what attaches the RNA complex to the membrane. This is the viral RNA. The clover leaf is at the five prime end. And the, here is the three prime end of the genome. And there, of course, there is a poly A sequence. This is a messenger RNA, of course, as well as a viral RNA. And this RNA becomes circularized, or maybe I should say the ends are brought together, because the poly A sequence is bound by a cell protein called poly A binding protein, PABP, which in turn will bind the clover leaf and all the proteins that are associated with it. So we have the five and the three prime ends of the RNA are brought together, and that, that's how initiation begins. Because here, uh, at the five prime end is the RNA polymerase, and once the three prime end is brought to it, it can start copying uh, that RNA and making a negative strand. And it uses the primer. We don't know how this VPG PU, PU gets over here to initiate priming, but somehow it does. You can see there's a magical leap uh, from here to here. Uh, and then that initiates synthesis on the three prime end, and then you get elongation, and eventually the synthesis of a negative strand. So here's our original plus strand, and now we have the negative strand. And then, of course, it's copied. The, the negative strand is copied again by a similar mechanism to make more plus strands. So these are very unusual mechanisms that uh, are belying the simplicity of this kind of scheme here, plus, minus, plus. Now, on the right is the scheme for alpha viruses. These are also plus strand viruses, but they do something different. They have a plus strand RNA. And so when they come in the cell, the first thing that happens is that they are translated. And you make a negative strand complement to make more genomes. But there is also the production of a small mRNA in the life cycle of these viruses. That RNA is made from this negative strand intermediate. We don't know why this has to be done this way. It works, and it's evolved to be this way. This virus could just as easily have a scheme like this, but it doesn't. It translates part of this plus strand, and it doesn't translate the rest, and the rest of it has to be accessed by what we call a subgenomic mRNA. So this is the life cycle for these viruses. We've talked about how some of these viruses enter cells before through endocytosis. 
So basically, this recapitulates what I've told you. The viral RNA gets put into the cytoplasm. The first half of it is translated, and the protein that is made is actually the viral RNA polymerase. That makes perfect sense, because that then goes on and copies that input RNA. It makes full-length negative strands and more plus strands. But it also takes uh, these negative strands and makes a small mRNA, the subgenomic mRNA, so that the second half of the genome can be accessed, because this translation step here is only translating the first half of the genome. By making this subgenomic mRNA, you get the second half produced, and eventually all the proteins made go for the production of new, new virus particles. So it's just a twist on getting your information in your genome decoded. And again, the problem is, if you have only one mRNA, you can either make a polyprotein or maybe you can make small RNAs from it. So this virus takes both strategies. It makes a polyprotein here, but it also makes a small subgenomic RNA. So here is an example where that negative strand has some function. It serves as a template for making uh, these mRNAs here. And here's another view of the same process, just to make it clear. Here's our viral RNA. When it gets into the cell, it's translated, but only half of it is translated. There's a stop code on here. That's the red dot. So you get these proteins produced, which are the RNA polymerase. Once they're made, they can replicate the plus into a minus strand and so on, back to plus and minus. But they can also, this polymerase can also make a subgenomic mRNA from the latter half of, of the negative strand. And that can be translated then to access these proteins. And again, I don't know why it works this way. You would think that it could just you could get rid of this stop codon and just keep translating and process it like polio, but it doesn't work that way. This has evolved, so apparently it is successful. <coughs> now, among the minus strand RNA viruses, there are both unimolecular genomes, that is an RNA in one piece, and segmented genomes, RNAs in pieces. We're going to talk about uh, both of these. Uh, the Negative strand viruses, of course, here's the genome of the negative strand virus. It's negative stranded. When it gets in the cell, it can't be recognized by the translation apparatus. So it has to come in the cell with an RNA polymerase. And that RNA polymerase has to make mRNA as the first step. Otherwise, you can't make proteins. Yeah? It comes in with proteins. Nothing can read it, exactly. Whenever you have a minus strand RNA coming into the cell, it always has to come in with proteins, multiple proteins that can copy it and make message. And that's what you see here. This is making messenger RNA from this minus strand. So that goes for the unimolecular R viruses or the segmented viruses. You always have to make a messenger RNA first. Once you make a message, then you can make proteins, and then you can replicate your genomes, which is what's happening here. You make a plus strand intermediate, which you throw away after you've copied it into negative strands. So it's the opposite of the plus strand viruses. For both unimolecular and segmented, you do mRNA synthesis first, and then you do genome replication. So let's look at this process in a little detail. Here is uh, our bullet-shaped virus, uh, vesicular stomatitis virus. Again, entry via endocytosis. The genome ends up in the cytoplasm. It's complexed with proteins. Remember, it's not naked. It can't be translated. It's a negative strand RNA. So that has to be made into mRNAs. That's step three here. We have individual mRNAs, which are then translated into proteins. And one of these proteins goes on and replicates the RNA and makes more mRNAs. All right? So again, to translate, you have to make a messenger RNA. And that all these proteins that are bound to the RNA have a role in that. They constitute not only the repetitive nucleoprotein that makes the helix, but also the RNA polymerases in there as well. And here's another look at that same virus, vesicular stomatitis virus. Here's the genome, a single long negative strand RNA. That's why we call it unimolecular. And when this comes into a cell, it's negative stranded. It can't be translated. It has to be copied into messenger RNAs. And that's what these little guys are down here. These are one, two, three, four, five mRNAs. They're all capped. They all have a poly A tail. They look just like cellular mRNAs. And the cell ribosomes just bind to them and translate, and you get all the viral proteins. 
make mRNA's first step, and then one of the proteins made is the RNA polymerase, which is this, the L protein. And that can then take this, this negative strand genome and make a plus strand. It has to make a full length plus strand. Remember, from end to end, it has to copy the whole thing. You can't just make an mRNA. You'll never get the virus back from those, right? Because you're missing sequences in between them. That's why you have to make a plus strand uh, intermediate. <clears throat> so here is how that works. You have our viral RNA. A polymerase goes on the three prime end that comes in with the virus. It makes these mRNAs here. And then eventually when you get some proteins made, the process switches to replication, which is to make a plus strand and then a minus strand. So there is a switch late in the replication cycle from making messages to making full length plus and then minus strands because eventually you have to make new virions and to do that you need more minus strands, right? The uh, organization of this virus goes back to that problem that we had before. You have uh, one mRNA or one RNA and you have to make multiple proteins from it. So this virus's approach is to make five subgenomic mRNAs. Remember the Bacornas make a big protein and cleave it. These viruses make five mRNAs. They could make a polyprotein from a plus strand and intermediate, but they don't. The way this um, synthesis works, here's again our negative strand uh, RNA, which comes in. The polymerase binds, is bound at the three prime end as it comes in with the particle. It makes the first messenger RNA, then it stops and that mRNA comes off, it's capped and polyadenylated, uh, and then the polymerase stays on the genome and makes the second messenger RNA, then it stops, and that RNA is released, and it keeps going down the line. So it has this polar progression uh, along the mRNA. And in between each gene, there's this Ig, an intergenic sequence. There is a stretch of U molecules in there. When the polymerase sees that, it starts to put A's in and it keeps going until there are one or two hundred A's, and that's a poly-A tail. So from a little sequence of seven U's, it makes a full-blown poly-A tail at the end of each messenger RNA. And then it stops making poly-A, it, it slips down a little, and then initiates the next mRNA. Very interesting scheme. Now, let's talk about a segmented or uh, negative strand RNA virus, influenza virus. This looks horribly complicated, right? And you're wondering, do I have to memorize this? And no, not really, but I, I just want to show some aspects of what we're talking about here. These viruses are negative stranded. They have segmented genomes. The genomes released by fusion of the endosome with the viral membrane. So now we have the RNAs in the cytoplasm. This is a negative stranded RNA. Are these RNAs naked? No, they have proteins on them to copy them into, into plus strands. They go into the nuclear pore. This is one RNA virus that needs the nucleus. Go into the nuclear pore, and then the, um, each strand, each negative strand, is copied to form a messenger RNA by the RNA polymerases that come in with each segment. So these are these mRNAs shown here. Those get exported into the cytoplasm to make viral proteins. Uh, eventually, you also have to make more genomes, these guys here. So you take your incoming negative strands, you make a full-length plus strand, and from those you make more genomes. And those go on to form new virus particles. Now, there's one aspect of this process that I want to tell you in some detail, and that is the priming of the mRNA synthesis. In other words, the, the incoming minus strand, you make an mRNA from it, that enzyme that comes in with the segment is primer dependent. And the primer that is used comes from cellular mRNAs. So here is, a, is an overall view of that. Again, for flu, we have eight RNA segments. They're all negative stranded. When those get in the nucleus, you make mRNAs from each of them, and those are translated into protein. That process from negative strand to mRNA requires a primer. And here is the primer that is used for that. Um, it's right here. It is a small piece of mRNA from the host cell. So this is uh, the viral RNA. Comes in covered with proteins. And from it, the first thing that has to happen is we want to make mRNA. The RNA polymerase that's embedded with this segment needs a primer. 
And so what it does is it grabs a host mRNA that happens to be near it, and it cuts its 5' prime end off. And it takes the cap plus about 10 or 12 bases from that mRNA. And it uses that as a primer. And that's why we think these viruses have to replicate in the nucleus, because they need newly synthesized mRNAs produced in the nucleus. So this primer, which ends up at the 5' prime end of every viral messenger RNA, is host cell derived. And it can come from any messenger RNA, not any one in particular. In fact, if you, if you extract influenza viral mRNAs from infected cells, the first 12 bases will be random. It will be derived from every possible mRNA in the cell. So that <clears throat> mRNA has a cell derived primer at the 5' prime end. And it also stops at about 20 nucleotides short of the template, because then it's polyadenylated. So this mRNA would not be good for making more viruses, because it's lacking sequence down here at the 3' prime end. All right, remember I said the requirement for genome replication is that you have to copy the genome from end to end. And this is not doing that. You're actually ending up short. So that's why we need another replication step. We have to copy this negative strand into a full length plus strand and then copy it into a full length minus strand and that is going to be our genome RNA. So the details here are not important for you to know that are all well, these proteins here on here. The important thing is is that the mRNA isn't a full length copy and that's why you need to make a plus strand. Yeah. So this is the question that you asking, isn't the host primer to make the mRNA not to the replication? Exactly, yes. To make this RNA from the negative strand you do not need a primer. It's unprimed, as you see here. It's very interesting, actually, because the same, the, the enzyme is slightly different. So in one case, to make mRNA, it's primer dependent. And in the other case, it's primer independent. <clears throat> and here's some detail on that very interesting process. We call it cap snatching, stealing of the cap from the host mRNA to prime mRNA synthesis. So here is the viral RNA. It's the 3 prime end. Here is a host mRNA. There's a cap structure and then some bases. And as I told you, the viral RNA polymerase actually has an endonuclease activity. So it cleaves host mRNAs about here, 13 bases on this one. And then the primer that results is used to initiate synthesis of the messenger RNA, which you can see here. So here's the mRNA that's made. This is the negative strand template. And they all have this bit of sequence from uh, host mRNAs. So that's probably one of the reasons why you need to be in the nucleus for these viruses. Now, all of these mRNAs are polyadenylated. And remember, I, I told you they uh, end up about 20 bases short of the template. And so this is a model of why that happens. It's actually very clever. Now, normally, you imagine a template in a polymerase is moving along the template and copying it, and a nucleic acid is being made. But uh, here, we think the template is being pulled through the polymerase somehow. So this polymerase consists of three subunits. And here is the viral RNA here in uh, the, the olive green. It's negative stranded. All right? It's bound here at the 5' prime end to the polymerase. The, this is a polymerase uh, making a plus strand mRNA. So here's the active site of the polymerase. It's being elongated. And imagine that this 3' prime end is being pulled through this complex. So as this moves past the active site, you elongate the mRNA product, right? You're pulling it through. But eventually, when you run out of loop here, uh, it stops. And there's still about 20 bases left here, but you can't copy them because you can't move. Well, what you're stuck at is a stretch of U's. So what do you think happens? The enzyme just keeps making A's over and over again until it gets tired and says, that's it, I've had it. And it get, the product gets released. And you have a polyadenylated mRNA, which lacks about 20 bases from the 3' prime end. So that, that may explain why we're missing those 20 bases, because you have this mechanism of pulling uh, the template through. OK, double-stranded RNA viruses do something different. Because remember, the double-stranded RNA, even though it has a plus strand, it can't be accessed by ribosomes. Uh, so what happens is um, this double strand is a template for the synthesis of a plus strand mRNA. So the virus, the virus has to bring in an RNA polymerase with it. 
So you may say, well, because it has a plus strand, couldn't that be used for translation? No, it can't because it's double-stranded and there's no way to denature it. So instead, the virus brings in a polymerase with the particle and then copies the negative strand of that duplex to make a plus strand mRNA for translation. And it actually makes uh, double strands from a subset of those as well. So these are both plus strand mRNAs made from the minus strand. One is used for translation and one is simply copied to make a negative strand. Now we have our double-stranded RNA, which is what we started with. Okay, and this is again by an enzyme that the virus brings in with it. So these are the real viruses, and they have segmented double-stranded RNA genomes. Remember, these are the viruses that are the dub double shell. They come in through the endocytic pathway. The outer shell is stripped off, and then the core particle goes into the cytoplasm. There are uh, a number of double-stranded RNA particles, three, six, nine, ten for this real virus. And uh, from each of those, an mRNA is made, shown here, and from those, proteins are made. So again, this is not translated. The genomic double-stranded RNA is not translated. It's copied to form a plus-strand uh, mRNA. Yes? I don't know if it has to actually be pulled apart. It could, you could just make a bubble and move it along the du duplex. Yeah, so it doesn't necessarily, and as Dr. Silverstein will show you for DNA, you don't have to pull the strand. You don't have to, no. You can just make a little denatured bubble and the polymerase can, can copy that. Yeah, it's really very nice. So here is a scheme of, of the replication of these viruses. And what I want to show you here is the virus is, just focus here, the virus is taken up by endocytosis. That outer capsid is stripped off, and the particle gets out of the endosome. And now we have this inner shell particle sitting in the cytoplasm. And that still has all the double-stranded RNAs in it. It has the enzymes to copy them. And that, that particle just sits there, and the, and the mRNAs come out of the, the, the each uh, five-fold axis of symmetry. There are 12 of those. Remember, it's icosahedral. And there's a little channel at each five-fold. And you can see on this picture these little squiggly uh, green guys coming out here. Those are mRNAs. They're made inside the particle and shot outside. And then they're translated in the cytosol, and they give rise to new particles eventually. We'll talk about that later. But all the mRNA synthesis takes place inside the particle. So it never really completely uncoats. And that's one of the reasons why I said initially that some viruses are active containers. They, it doesn't, they don't discharge all of their RNA or nucleic acid into the cytoplasm. Here's the reason for that. Okay, the mRNAs, again, copied off the double-stranded RNA template by a polymerase that's in the particle, and the mRNAs are extruded through the turret. Now, there is a very nice structure of this process, which I want to show you. These are cryo-electron micrographs of rotaviruses, same virus in this family. And these were in the process of making mRNA when the cryo-EM was done. So here's the particle here. And you can see these little purple things sticking out here. That's the, that's the mRNA coming out right here. So right there. So this is one of the 12 turrets at each five-fold axis of symmetry. And I told you we think the RNA comes out of here as it's made in the interior. And this is actually a model for how that might happen. The, the only density they got in these uh, cryo-EMs was this little bit here, and they, they filled in the rest. This is the RNA, the mRNA coming out of this portal, if you will. It's made inside the particle uh, and comes out. Very neat. <clears throat> Now, an important thing that you, you should know is that RNA synthesis is an important source of diversity. All of these polymerases that we've talked about today, they make errors. Well, in fact, every nucleic acid polymerase makes errors, and the RNA polymerases make one mistake out of every 1,000 or 10,000 bases that they make. So you, some of these viral genomes are 10,000 bases long, so every time they're, they're copied, there's a mistake made. The wrong base is put in. Despite those wonderful polymerases, you know, that sometimes they see a, there's an A there and they put something else instead of a U. Now, RNA polymerases don't have proofreading like DNA polymerases do. They can say, ah, oh, the wrong base here, take it out and fix it. But RNA polymerases don't do that, so they have a very high error rate. But in many ways, that's good because it contributes to the diversity of RNA viruses. And in fact, um, 
we're going to use we're going to talk about that much more later on in this course because uh, it is an important source of new viruses and viral evolution so just remember that this RNA synthesis is really important for diversity of RNA viruses and I promised I'd tell you about the non-templated RNA synthesis that occurs for some viruses all that means is that Templated RNA synthesis, you have an RNA template in the polymerase copies every base and makes a faithful copy. Non-templated is when it puts something in that isn't in the template. And so this happens with measles and mumps virus. These are viruses with single negative strand RNA genomes. And from them, the, the individual mRNAs are made when these viruses come into cell. Remember, there's a polymerase in the particle that does that. All those mRNAs are, are faithful copies of the template, except here in this pMRNA, it's the second mRNA made from the end. Now and then, a certain fraction of the time, the polymerase inserts an extra base that's not in the template. And we're not sure why, but there's some kind of an RNA structure in this region. We think the polymerase bumps into it. And, and makes a mistake, adds an extra base. But in fact, it's beneficial for the virus because not all, not all the messenger RNAs have this extra base, but the ones that do can make a different protein. So here's the schematic of this. Um, here is this, the minus strand RNA template. So normally it's copied um, to make a faithful mRNA copy, but some of the time this extra G is inserted here. So Again, the polymerase makes a mistake. It makes a G here, but there's no G. There's no C templated by that G uh, on the negative strand template. And then it resumes copying downstream. The net result is you have one extra G in this mRNA that's not in the template. So that's what we mean by non-templated mRNA synthesis. So the result is that normally you have one protein made from this normal mRNA, which is shown here. But if you add an extra G, the, the reading frame changes downstream of the gene, you get a different sequence. So this protein has a different C-terminal sequence from this one. So you can make two different proteins, and in fact, these viruses depend on doing this. If you take this away, they're not happy. Um, so it's another way of getting more genetic information out of a single mRNA. So you can see a number of tricks now that have emerged to do this. Yes? You asked, it's not deliberate? It's deliberate. Yeah, it appears to be because it's been evolutionarily conserved. It's not taken away. It makes a protein that has a specific function. Yeah. So the, the replication scheme of this virus has evolved to incorporate this into it. All right. 